Okay, so while people are uh, slowly trickling in, so I can start with the, maybe the general introduction. Uh, it's really my pleasure to, uh, <clears throat> to introduce our today's seminar speaker, um, Professor Lillian Chung from Department of Chemistry at the University of Pittsburgh. Before I introduce uh, Lillian a little bit more, so I would like to remind everyone that uh, it is recommended to keep your cameras on, but please turn off your microphone when the seminar starts. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and then we can, I can call on you during the seminar. I hope you don't mind any on, or maybe the, toward the end of the seminar when we have the questions and answers. I, I'm gonna invite you actually to ask your question yourself, hopefully with the camera and microphone on and then uh, that way we can have a more interactive uh, discussion session. So uh, with that again, uh, so by way of introduction, uh, Lillian um, received her <clears throat> bachelor's degree in chemistry from MIT. And then he did a, she did a PhD in biophysics with the late Peter Coleman, one of the leaders in the field uh, at UCSF, where she started studying actually a very timely topic, which we are dealing with now, working on antibodies and enzyme catalysis. Uh, after receiving her PhD, she moved to Stanford when she did a postdoc with Vijay Pande, which we all know, again, another leader in the field, uh, before joining uh, the Pittsburgh area for initially as a as an affiliated faculty to joint uh, <clears throat> CMU, Pittsburgh Computational Biology, Molecular Biophysics and the Structural Biology program. And then later uh, she joined the Department of Chemistry as a faculty, as a tenure track faculty member where she is now as an, uh, an assist, associate professor in the chemistry department. She has received multiple awards. I'm not gonna go through them to uh, <laughs> take too much time. Uh, but uh, I just mentioned the uh, uh, Hewlett Packard Outstanding Junior Faculty Award and NSF Career Award as two examples of awards that she received during her faculty position. Research wise, uh, she is very much interested in the things that we are interested in, sort of simulation and understanding by molecular systems, but specifically um, uh, on um, <clears throat> sort of sampling rare events using, for example, weighted ensemble approaches, and then uh, uh, also pathways for binding and kinetics. And these are really important areas in molecular simulation where we all would love to be able to do them sufficiently. So she's gonna talk about this uh, today. So thanks again, uh, Lilian, for accepting our invitation and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation, Iman, and for that really kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to visit you today virtually, and nice to see so many friends in the audience uh, just before break. Um, so uh, I want to start with uh, an explanation of this art of possibility in my title here. And this is the way I like to think about some of our weighted ensemble efforts, as well as um, other things in life. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite life philosophy books out here. It's called The Art of Possibility, and it's written by Rosamund Zander and Benjamin Zander, um, so an exec executive coach and a symphony conductor. Um, and the idea is this, when you have encounter any problem in life out there, there's often ways of reframing the problem. So in other words, you could enlarge the box or create another frame around the data and problems vanish while new opportunities appear. So let me just give you a simple illustration of how this might work. Um, so this is uh, a puzzle that many of you have probably seen, this famous nine dot puzzle, and the instructions are to join all nine dots with four straight lines without taking the pen from the paper. Um, so often uh, what we hear in the, di uh, the directions here is that um, uh, we wanna draw the straight lines within the square that's formed by the outer dots. And if we do that, 
then you, you might draw these four lines here and you're, we're missing the middle dot there. So that middle dot is unconnected. So we haven't succeeded there, but uh, what if we um, looked beyond the obvious interpretation of the instructions? Um, so what if you use the entire sheet of paper there uh, so if you could draw the lines beyond those outer dots to use the four lines without taking the pen from the paper, then you can join all nine dots. Um, so this is one way of reframing the problem here so that those usual constraints that uh, we assumed were constraints uh, go away. Uh, so what is the problem in our case here? Uh, well, in my lab, um, our main technique is to use molecular dynamics simulations, um, is these computational microscopes, this term that Klaus Schulten, uh, I think, coined. Um, so we want to be able to simulate how atoms move according to the laws of physics and chemistry. So when I was a grad student with Peter Coleman, um, and he asked me what I wanted to work on as a student, um, I wanted to be able to simulate how proteins recognize their partners and all of the conformational changes along the way. Um, and I wanted to look at the complete pathways without forcing anything to occur. So you could go after the questions about the kinetics. Um, so this is a movie of Barney's bar star binding here in explicit solvent. The flickering molecules are explicit solvent molecules. And back then we weren't able to figure out how to reframe this problem. So it was doable, but actually um, the strategies that would enable those simulations were available back then. <laughs> so um, it wasn't really until uh, five years ago. Sorry, did somebody ask a question? Oh, okay. All right, um, so it was really until five years ago when we were able to, to reframe the problem. So this is gonna be my talk. I'm gonna talk about how we, we, were, we found a way to reframe the problem for simulating long time scale processes um, and then two different applications. So these are sort of two bookends to the talk. So one at the quantum level where I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you how we simulated some chemical reactions. Um, and then I'm gonna wrap up with our efforts uh, as part of a massive team where uh, our part of the collaboration was to uh, help simulate the opening of the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID uh, virus. Okay, so how can we reframe this problem of simulating long time scales, uh, long time scale processes? Well, so one issue with standard simulations is that um, if you start many simulations from your initial state of your process, uh, where each sphere is a different simulation, then most of the time, the simulations are going to spend fluctuating in that initial state. And we're waiting around for that lucky fluctuation to make it over the barrier. Um, but once that transition, uh, once something transitions over the barrier, it's relatively quick. So this is what we think about as rare events, that they're infrequent, but relatively fast. Uh, so in the early days of folding at home, what they were doing, uh, a clever thing that they were doing to capture folding events um, was to run tens of thousands of independent simulations to increase your chances of capturing these lucky fluctuations over the barrier. Um, but even in that mode of running simulations, which is still a brute force way, uh, we're still spending a lot of time in uh, just waiting around for lucky fluctuations. And we could be spending more time in sampling the tr actual transitions, the functional transitions between the stable states. Um, so this is one way of reframing the problem here is um, how can we uh, focus the computing power on just the transitions here and minimize the time that we're spending in the initial stable state. Now, there's many different ways of um, doing this. I'm just gonna illustrate um, the general idea of how one might do this with this uh, Super Mario Brothers video. So um, 
if you've ever played this video game, the goal is for Super Mario to jump over all these different steel pipes to reach the finish line. Um, and the brute force way of playing this game is that you can um, just keep playing the game over and over again until you make it to the very end. So that would be the brute force way of doing it, but we could instead um, save the game from where we last left off and repeat from that point. And so um, this is a video play that's showing you how we might do that. So there's many different ways that you can, yeah, where it's game over, but we just restart from that last point um, until he eventually makes it to the finish line. Um, so there are many different ways of repeating where you left off. Over the last 10 years or so, my lab has been having a lot of fun with uh, what's been called the weighted ensemble strategy. Um, and so this is a strategy uh, that we used to generate that movie that I showed of the proteins binding. Um, and that was just, that was work that was just published last year, the beginning of 2019. Um, so the idea there is that we define a progress coordinate towards the target state. We divide it up into bins. And then we run a large number of short weighted trajectories that are replicated at fixed time intervals whenever you make transitions to empty bins. So whenever we're making transitions from less important regions to more important regions in configurational space. Um, and so when we replicate the trajectories, we're enriching for success and we split the weights of the trajectories among the child trajectories. And occasionally, if we wanna save computing power, we terminate trajectories that are not making any progress and we merge its weight onto a trajectory that we're continuing here. Um, so uh, you can find more details in uh, the original Huber and Kim paper, which came out in 1996. Um, this was a method that was um, rediscovered by Daniel Zuckerman, who I've been collaborating over the last 10 years with, and the two of us uh, co-wrote a review together on weighted ensemble uh, that came out in 2017. Um, so uh, the important features of weighted ensemble that really appeal to us is that it can generate completely unbiased pathways, and that's due to the rigorous weighting of the trajectories. So they're unbiased and they're continuous pathways, um, and they can be generated with orders of magnitude less computing time than your standard MD brute force simulations. Um, and that's because of the fact that the transition times can be orders of magnitude faster than the waiting times in your initial stable state. And um, what's even better is that this efficiency improves the slower your process because it scales exponentially with the free energy barrier that we're dealing with. Um, and then the other thing uh, that is flexible about this approach is that we can run it in a way such that we don't have to strictly define the target states. Um, and then finally, um, there's nothing more direct than using pathways, than generating pathways to examine the mechanism of a process. And that includes all the states along the process, including transient states that might be too fleeting for experiments to capture. Okay, so where are we now with simulations in terms of time scales that we can access? Um, as you probably know, um, we're dealing with uh, six, uh, more than 16 orders of magnitude range in time scales here, ranging from your femtosecond time steps that will capture the bond vibrations out to seconds and beyond. Um, with your standard MD simulations on typical clusters, we can get up to microseconds, um, which is quite an improvement since when I was a grad student, um, we can capture hinge bending, loop motion, some interesting protein motions like that. And then uh, we have uh, a specialized supercomputer like Anton over the years that has enabled simulations up to milliseconds. Um, and GPUs have also enabled us to reach that time scale as well. Um, and so that uh, with those um, time scales up to milliseconds, we can start to look at protein folding 
and large scale conformational changes. So those functional interesting transitions. Weighted ensemble MD, we've, we've been able to capture uh, pathways uh, for processes as slow as seconds time scale. So um, this is really extending, greatly extending the time scales that are accessible to all atom molecular dynamics. Now, um, this isn't a, there's no free lunch here. So every method does have its approximations. Uh, the major approxim, the limitation, the caveat that weighted ensemble has is that um, it's typically run with a progress coordinate. And there's always this chance that we could be missing slow coordinates that are orthogonal to the progress coordinate. Now that said, um, we can switch the progress coordinates on the fly during the simulation because the trajectory weights are completely independent of the progress coordinates. So there is that flexibility. And also my lab has uh, worked several years on scaling up the strategy to tackle complex systems and processes. And that was uh, developing WESPA, so the Weighted Ensemble Simulation Toolkit with parallelization analysis we're in Pennsylvania, the dot on the E is Pittsburgh where we are. Um, so this is highly scalable out to thousands of CPU cores as well as GPUs. Um, and weighted ensemble is a strategy that is rigorous for any type of stochastic dynamics. So that means you can run it with molecular uh, dynamics um, as well as Monte Carlo, Browning dynamics, um, systems, biology, algorithms, et cetera. So we designed this package to be interoperable. So you could use it with your favorite dynamics engine, um, whether it be NAMD, OpenMM, Amber, um, and it's modular. So it's already um, been extended at, uh, for certain plugins by various groups. So there's a W Explorer uh, plugin from Alex Dixon, uh, weighted ensemble based string method plugin. Um, as well as others. Uh, so uh, this WESPA package has enabled us to tackle a number of different problems over the years in my lab. So this has ranged from um, coarse grain applications to atomistic so far in terms of published work. Um, so even in the coarse grain world, there are some problems that cannot be, that haven't been feasible with just your brute force methods. Um, our most ambitious application that's been published um, is our simulation of Barney's bar star binding in explicit solvent. Um, and uh, this was a study that generated uh, hundreds of pathways as well as rate constants. And that could be done today uh, with our usual, our current hardware in 10 days using 16 GPUs. And um, it's worth noting that what the com uh, computing time that was required for this study was only uh, less than 1% of the simulation time that was used to uh, generate a converged Markov state model from Frank Noe's study. Um, okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, the application that I wanna start by um, talking about in this seminar is our application at the quantum level. Um, so, going to the quantum level, uh, how far can we push this? So um, we started with a proof of principle reaction. Um, this is a diffusion controlled reaction between uh, an azide anion and a trimethyl cation here. And it's in a mixture of acetonitrile and water um, at around room temperature, well, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and the nice thing about this set of reactions, um, these were experimentally ca uh, characterized back in 1991, is that uh, there are rate constants available for all these reactions, uh, which means that we can have a nice means of validating our simulations. And these reactions uh, range anywhere from hundreds of nanoseconds to the microsecond time scale. And that depends on the substituent at this R position here. Um, and this was a project that was done uh, by my grad student, Anthony Boghetti, as well as a former student of mine, Matthew Zwier, um, who is now an associate professor at Drake University. 
Um, so this project is not about just locating transition states. It's about uh, generating all the transient states along the pathway uh, in explicit solvent. And um, despite the simplicity of this reaction, there, it's still rich with mechanistic questions that could be asked. Um, for example, if you look at this cation here um, and the resonance structures that you could draw for this cation, uh, the uh, azide anion could add to a number of positions here. You could, the, the positive charge is actually delocalized throughout the molecule. So um, this is the major product. So that's our target product where the azide anion would add to the central carbon. But you can see that there's a partial positive charge at these various positions on uh, the substituent phenyls. So these are potential alternate products that I've labeled in blue here, uh, the sites of addition. Um, we also focused on three different cations with different substituents. So um, different substituents at that R position, um, ranging from uh, an electron donating substituent to an electron withdrawing substituent. Um, so th these cations might actually look familiar to you if you've taken a physical organic chemistry course. Um, they're, they're actually in those textbooks as an example of how uh, these electron donating substituents and electron withdrawing substituents could impact the rate of the reaction. So um, in principle, this would be the slowest reaction since uh, the central carbon um, has a reduced uh, positive charge and uh, the electron withdrawing uh, cation would have the fastest reaction because the central carbon is, has the greatest positive charge. And this is the unsubstituted version. Okay, so our simulation model, this is a proof of principle study. So we started with a semi-empirical level of theory just for the reactants here. And the solvent was treated with a fixed charge model. So uh, tip 3P, as well as compatible parameters for acetonitrile, we went with um, the full deal. So PME treatment of long range electrostatics. Um, and this was our weighted ensemble protocol here. So the first thing that we did was to generate an extensive ensemble of the unassociated reactants. And we did this with the standard simulation. We generated 50 different relative orientations. So the cation is in the middle here and um, these blue molecules are the anions. And so the, this is showing all the different positions of the anions relative to the cation. And then we started a weighted ensemble simulation from these randomly selected orientations of the reactants. And then what was our progress coordinate? So uh, the strategy for choosing a progress coordinate is that you wanna pick one that captures the slowest relevant motion for your process of interest. And in our case, we picked a two-dimensional progress coordinate in which one dimension was tracking the distance between any of these nitrogens to the central carbon of the cation. And the second dimension was to track um, the distance between the nitrogen and any of these phenyl carbons uh, that are colored in blue. So that's to allow for the formation of those alternate products due to the resonance stabilization. Um, so how did we do? Uh, this is a probability distribution based on all those successful pathways that we were able to generate with this progress coordinate. So about 6,000 reaction pathways. Um, and this took only four days using 200 G, uh, CPU cores of, of these Intel processors. Um, so the target product here is shown by this yellow star. Um, and you can see that there are, I've, I've indicated a representative pathway here in yellow um, that reaches the target product. Uh, we also get pathways to the alternate product, which is uh, indicated by this blue star here. Okay, so uh, I also want to mention that these reaction pathways uh, due to weight that are generated by weighted ensemble, they do share um, some common trajectory segments because of the nature of the strategy. And so they do have some correlation and we're in the process of 
um, determining just how many of these pathways are completely uncorrelated in time. And so that's probably going to be in the hundreds there. Um, so let's take a look at one of these, this blue pathway to the alternate product. So um, as I mentioned, uh, this is all an explicit solvent. Um, here's the azide anion, and this is the um, cation here. And you're going to see this anion add to one of the phenyl carbons as the alternate product. And what I'm showing in the lower left are the probabilities of these snapshots. So you can see that these are very low probabilities, which is what you would expect for rare events. Okay, so, whoops, I misspoke. This is actually moving to the major product here. So this is to adding to the central carbon. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so how did we do uh, with the reaction kinetics? Uh, we were able to generate a, a sufficient number of reaction events to get a converged rate constant for each of these three reactions. Um, so this is the column for our computed rate constants. Uh, and then the experimental values are in the last column. And you can see that in all of these cases, our rate constants are um, in reasonably agreement with experiment um, given the uncertainties. Um, and so, uh, with the unsubstituted cation, uh, this is in the, uh, the second row. Um, it is a, a faster reaction than the cation with the electron donating substituent, um, but not as fast as the cation with the electron withdrawing substituent. Um, one other quantity that weighted ensemble simulations can get a lot of statistics on is the percent of productive collisions. Um, so how many of these collisions between reactions actually succeed to the final product? Um, and that is shown in this column here. And uh, you see a greater percentage of productive collisions as uh, the substituent gets more electron withdrawing. Okay. So to, just to summarize this part of the talk, um, we generated atomistic pathways for a set of these anion cation additions in an explicit solvent. And it was uh, a sufficient number of pathways to yield rate constants that agreed reasonably with the experiment. Um, so we're very encouraged by that. Um, and one thing that our simulations revealed that uh, wasn't known before about these reactions is, are the, is the formation of those alternate products. Um, and those are products that would not have been detectable by the original experiments. Um, and based on this proof of principle study, just a ballpark estimate, um, uh, we've shown that you can use weighted ensemble to enable the simulation of microseconds to millisecond timescale reactions when you have less than 50 atoms in the quantum mechanical region. Of course, it depends on the level of theory that you're using for the quantum mechanics. Um, and also, uh, things are improving all the time. So um, I'm aware of the NAND GPU accelerated QMMM engine. And so that should help a lot in terms of uh, um, enabling access to these longer time scale reactions. All right, so I want to wrap up now with um, uh, sharing with you some about our efforts involving uh, uh, the coronavirus. And um, this was part of a massive team effort that recently won the Gordon Bell Special Prize. So um, this was AI-driven multi-scale simulations illuminate dynamics of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, spike protein, so 28 members, 10 institutions, four supercomputing centers. Uh, this includes developers of NAND and VND, um, your group at the University of Illinois. Um, and this was dedicated to the memory of Klaus Schulten. Um, so uh, that's been one of the great developments, I think, during this pandemic are all the collaborative teams that have formed to study the coronavirus and this open sharing of data and its be fantastic to see our simulation community become a model community for open sharing of data. Um, so my student Anthony and I, uh, so here in Pittsburgh, got involved in this, the part of the collaboration with Romeo Merrill's group at UCSD 
Uh, and this was all because of one grad student that we got involved who took the initiative to contact us uh, through our WESPA users mailing list to ask for help on her simulation. So this was Tara Zing, and she was a joint student between the Burkert and um, Andy McCammon's lab. Um, and she was very interested in simulating how the spike would open before it latches onto cells during infection. So this is that gorgeous view of the, the coronavirus and these, the spike proteins, as you may know, are on the surface here. Um, and so uh, we thought about it, it was the largest system that we've ever thought about simulating and um, excited to uh, figure out how far we could push this project. So um, standard in these simulations of the spike opening would just take years. There's just no way that we could go about it without forcing events to occur with all atom models. Um, so we were focusing on just this portion of the spike, leaving out the stock protein, the, the minimal part of the spike uh, to look at the opening process. Um, what was our weighted ensemble protocol? Um, we spent a lot of time um, sampling the closed state ensemble initially to make sure that it was well equilibrated, that we were starting from representative confirmations. Uh, and then we ran a separate weighted ensemble simulation of the spike opening process from those pre-equilibrated confirmations of the closed state. Um, uh, these were started from a model of the closed spike that was uh, generated by the Amero lab. Um, and so this is a picture of that model um, with the receptor binding domain in cyan. So this is the binding domain that is hidden in the closed state and eventually it will pop out um, and be exposed to be able to uh, interact with uh, the ACE2 receptor on human cells. And this entire thing when it's sulfated is around 600,000 atoms. And the model that we used, we used the charm force field, uh, tip 3P water, uh, a physiological concentration of NACL, um, and then PME treatment of long range electrostatics. And this was a collaboration with Tara, the grad student that had uh, contacted us, as well as Shirley on in the, in the McCammon lab, Anthony Bogetti in my lab, and Romeo Amaro. Okay, so what was the progress coordinate that we went with here? So again, we're trying to capture the slowest relevant motion here uh, for the opening. And so uh, we used a 2D progress coordinate, and one dimension was tracking the root mean square deviation of the structure from the open state. So this is the PDB code for one of the open states out there from cryo EM. Um, and then the other dimension was tracking the distance between the centers of mass of the uh, receptor binding domain, so the RBD domain and the core domain. Okay, so how well did we do? We, we were in fact able to generate um, more than a thousand spike opening pathways. Um, some of those are correlated. Um, and what I'm showing here is uh, a view of all the different confirmations that were visited in our simulation. And we've colored them based on the percent accessibility of the RBD domain. So it just uh, the percent exposure to solvent. So up here is the um, closed state here, and then the open state is down here. Okay. And what I'm overlaying on top is a pathway in yellow. So you can see it's spending a lot of time in the closed state and then in the transient states, uh, less time. And then finally in the open state, it's spending more time uh, as uh, the open state is another stable state. All right, so uh, how long does this all take? Um, so I mentioned that we generated uh, more than a thousand pathways. Um, if we take into account um, time correlation, 133 of these are independent. Um, and this was done in 23 days uh, using 100 NVIDIA V100 GPUs. Uh, and, and it generated a massive amount of data, 100 terabytes of data. This is really <laughs> quite a um, thing to go after here with the 600,000 atoms. Um, so uh, to estimate how long this would take with standard MD here, 
um, we're just going to assume that this is a large scale transition that can take anywhere from microseconds to milliseconds. Maybe it takes even longer, but just given that time scale, um, if you were to generate 100 pathways with standard MD, this would take somewhere between 10 months to eight years. Um, so weighted ensemble is at least 13 times to 127 times more efficient than standard MD in generating these spike opening pathways here. Now I'm going to show you a movie of how this spike is opening. So this is a top view of the spike protein. And in cyan, you're seeing the RBD, so the receptor binding domain. And then in blue, I forgot to mention, these are the glycans that are shielding uh, the spike protein. Um, so you're going to see that eventually that this um, cyan domain, so the RBD is going to um, be in the down position, in the open position, it will uh, suddenly move up. Um, and this is partly gated by these uh, glycans that are shown in blue. All right. Um, so I mentioned that these glycans shield the RBD in the closed state. So there are these two modes in the closed state um, you see the blue is shielding uh, the cyan and the magenta, which is part of the RBD domain. Um, and then in the open state, uh, the RBD is in sort of an attack mode. It's, in the ex it's fully more exposed and able to uh, latch on to the host cells. Okay, so to, to summarize here, um, weighted ensemble was able to enable uh, the generation of atomistic pathways. And this was quite an achievement for us in the weighted ensemble community, as well as just what you can tackle in general with molecular dynamic simulation. So this is a long time scale functional motion um, somewhere uh, between the microsecond and milliseconds or beyond uh, with a large protein. So around 600,000 atoms. Um, and our simulation showed how the spike is opening. So the, uh, these, the whole ensemble of these continuous pathways of opening um, that could, uh, that includes these transient states that can be used to rationally manipulate the kinetics of a process. Um, and our movie also showed uh, how the glycans are uh, shielding uh, the spike initially in these closed state and then exposing the domain for interaction with the human receptor in the open state. So we're working towards estimating rate constants, which is a very challenging endeavor in general for this rare event sampling field for these much longer time processes. Um, so how can we further improve the efficiency of weighted ensemble? Um, well, uh, so far, our efforts, our published efforts have involved trial and error <laughs> of placing the bins along a progress coordinate. And, and you can adjust those bin positions on the fly. But um, since then, we have developed um, what we think of as the minimal scheme for adaptively placing the bins along a progress coordinate. And um, the idea is very simple, where you tag um, the boundary walkers, so the um, trailing and leading walkers trajectories along the progress coordinate, which are highlighted in yellow here. And then we also identify bottleneck trajectories. So those are trajectories that have probabilities that are about to sharply fall. Um, and then those are all given their own bins for replication. So um, this replication of trajectories at the boundaries, as well as at the, in the bottleneck regions um, helps quite a bit in terms of surmounting large barriers. And we found that um, we can use a fixed number of bins between the trailing and leading walkers, and that this is a much fewer number of bins than we would require if we use just your usual manual fixed binning scheme. So uh, we apply this scheme to a number of different uh, benchmark processes. Um, one of them is, uh, this toy potential where you have an extremely large barrier of 35 kT, so in other words, uh, 20 kcals per mole. And a manual fixed spinning scheme, it basically just is stuck 
in this initial state A here. Um, when we use our, um, our minimal adaptive binning scheme, so the MAB scheme, you can see that we get pretty even coverage um, all the way into this uh, state B. Uh, and this is showing in panel B the distribution of uh, the bottleneck trajectories. And they tend to be positioned along this uh, the steep part of the barrier. Okay. What else are we doing in terms of more efficiently uh, estimating rate constants? Uh, we also developed the rate from event duration scheme. Um, and this is enabling rate constant estimation from shorter trajectories. So in other words, before the simulation has reached steady state. Um, so the idea is this, usually when you monitor the evolution of the rate constant estimate with time, there's usually this transient phase. Uh, and, and usually that transient phase is thrown out and, and we wait until the rate constant has leveled off before we start analyzing the simulation. But it turns out that that transient phase is actually quite useful. So you can think of it um, in analogy to uh, a cross country race here. So let's look at this race over a hill. Um, we can calculate, we can estimate the average time that it takes for a team of runners to make it to the finish line um, by tracking uh, the times for the initial runners, the fastest runners that make it over. Um, and so this is analogous to the ramp up time here when we're looking at the rate constant estimate versus uh, what we call molecular time in the weighted ensemble simulation. Um, and we can incorporate the ramp up time by uh, accounting for the distribution of the event durations. So event, event durations are just the barrier crossing times. So the times leaving out uh, the waiting times in the initial state. Okay, so how well do we do? We applied this scheme to our Barney's bar star simulation. So just reanalyze the simulation that was already run. Um, uh, this gray line is the experimental value. And in blue is what we would have gotten with the original way of calculating the rate constant. So directly from the flux into your target state. If we correct that flux with the uh, distribution of event durations, this is shown in red here. Um, so that's what we call the red scheme here. Um, and you can see that the red is leveling off um, earlier than the blue scheme. Um, and so all the way up until this point, this is 75% of the total simulation time uh, that would have been invested for the original weighted ensemble prediction in blue. Okay, so we're pretty encouraged by that. Um, I just wanna wrap up with some take home messages here. So um, hopefully I've convinced you that weighted ensemble um, can enable simulations of these long timescale processes. And, and this is ranging from the quantum mechanical level uh, with these smaller systems to the atomic level for quite large proteins. Um, and the other point I wanted to make is that weighted ensemble provides very extensive sampling. So it's, it's been useful for testing the accuracy of existing force fields and that includes dynamical properties, kinetics properties. Um, and then the final point is that this is a strategy that still hasn't reached its full potential. So there are still um, many directions for improving its effic efficiency in terms of methods as well as software development. All right, and I just wanna thank you for your kind attention during this virtual seminar during this unusual time. Um, this is my group and I wanna just give a shout out that we do have a postdoc position that's available to start in the summer. Okay. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much, Lillian. Very, very convincing, actually. <laughs> so I'm convinced. In fact, actually, I have a question, maybe a provocative question. Sure. So why don't we see everybody using weighted ensemble? I mean, this is so efficient. <laughs> So good. I mean, instead of running ten copies of simulations and wasting our time, so what's what is what is the what is the other side? Why why are people not using uh, it as 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 I expect actually? 
Is there any? Well, I, I can't speak for everyone, but <laughs> I, I have some suspicions. I, I know that there is quite a ramp up time to learning how to use it. So you have to start by being an expert in just straightforward simulations first. I see. And then um, only after that, you can venture into um, using these rare event sampling approaches. We've tried to lower the hurdle as much as we can for yes. using it with our open source software, and we're still trying to work on streamlining it more for people. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But also, I, I think uh, this is there's ideas in this strategy that um, are common to a lot of other strategies out there. And it, I think it's really only recently that software has become available that's open source and not just used in house. Um, and, and that's become highly scalable so that you can really tackle some ambitious problems with it. I see. Actually, related to that, in fact, um, um, I mean, you mentioned it can be used with NAMD as well, but mm -hmm. it wasn't on your slide, but since you mentioned it, so uh, Vespa essentially takes care of all the waiting, reweighting, sort of uh, yes. generating multiple copies. And do you always restart new runs after each kind of cycle? Is that you have yeah, to? Yeah, at fixed time intervals, we, we yep, we start new ones. I see, I see. Cool. So, and actually, I'm encouraging everybody in my group at least to consider to run some of uh, some weighted ensemble calculation because it was really impressive to see protein protein binding and <laughs> opening complete opening of the of the uh, spike protein. That is uh, something that people are still struggling with. So I see that if you guys have any questions, uh, you can either just mention. Jale, you have a question? Yes. You can go ahead. Hi. Hi. Thanks. It was a great talk. My oh, thank you. Inspiring. OK, so I have a question about, uh, I was curious to know about the criterion of uh, propagating or killing a trajectory, specifically if I don't know the final state or mm -hmm. Can I use this method as just an exploratory tool? Yeah, so it's it's an algorithm that is efficient about filling empty bins. Mm -hmm. So you, you could use it as uh, an enhanced conformational sampling method. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, if you wanted to explore alternate states of your, of a folded state of a protein, you could use um, an RMSD coordinate starting from that initial structure and just encourage it to go towards larger values see. Uh, to see you know which minima you might start populating uh -huh. and then how about uh, uh some of the systems that might be uh, higher might be in higher dimensions for example maybe one or two coordinates will not be enough to describe them yeah, so we usually don't go beyond two dimensional coordinates because it can get pretty expensive because <laughs> it, it just explodes in terms of the number of trajectories <clears throat> that you're running at one time. But what we can do is run nested coordinates. So you, you could um, track one coordinate up to a certain point and then switch to another coordinate um, when you get to a particular part of the process. Uh -huh. And just one more, just quickly. Go ahead, that's fine. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so you mentioned that you have more than 100 independent pathways for the opening up of the spike. Mm -hmm. Are they uh, functionally independent or what are some of the interesting differences that might came out within these? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by functionally independent. Um, um, so, you, so you mentioned that they're independent. I mean, so are they just... <coughs> in terms of you know just from from the close to the open state or there is anything yeah. of the reaction coordinates that you picked up was interesting interestingly uh, difference between them for example one of them might you know did something different with respect to you know some of the dominant path. yeah so this is based on um the autocorrelation of the flux into the target state that we can we define um whether they're correlated or not um, so they, um, and they do uh, spread out into different parts of the configurational space when you look at all the mm -hmm. different pathways. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Yeah, and then back to the progress coordinate thing, I just want to also mention that um, if, if you did have a good idea of a committer probab a committer coordinate right. uh, for your system, that, that's, that's, that could be a perfect coordinate and then you mm -hmm. can uh, adaptively bin along that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the case of a spike, I mean, you show, you show the two dimensional space that you guys explore, center of mass distance and, uh, and RMSD. So did you go back and forth between the, these, the two as the progress coordinate during the Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see, so that's interesting. How did you decide when to jump to the other coordinate? And uh, Yeah, so it, it is a bit of trial and error. Um, so at the time, if, if it seemed like the simulations had stalled for quite a number of iterations, then right. um, we would start analyzing other coordinates from the data that we already generated to mm -hmm. see if something else might be more encouraging. Nanda, you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, Hi. So I have a question regarding, so you mentioned that you don't need to know the end state when you start exploring. Yes. Then, then how do you decide the direction of your, uh, like okay. where to, yeah, where to like uh, weight your ensemble, like in the phase space? Um, so, so the weighting works by just ensuring that the sum of all your trajectory weights is one at any time. So, so there, there's a Bayesian proof that you're not destroying any information there and you know, you're tracking the packets of probability properly. Um, so it, um, it, it doesn't really depend on what your target state definition is. So, so again, it's completely independent of your progress coordinate definition. It's just tied to the individual trajectories. You can think of them as packets of probability. I see, I see, I see, I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shashang? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, hi. So actually, I think you uh, touched a little bit about this. I have a question regarding the binning. So it seems like uh, the calculation or even the pathways or the probability that you are getting from uh, weighted ensemble uh, simulations might be very sensitive towards the bin size that you are deciding. So I think you did talk about adaptive scheme, but can you uh, tell us a little bit more about how the binning is decided a priori before the simulation? Yeah. Uh, so originally I can tell you our strategy was to place the bins roughly one KT in energy, so they would be more closely spaced along the steeper parts of your barrier and further spaced along um, shallower parts. Um, and then that's actually what our adaptive binning strategy is giving you because of um, the positions of your trailing and leading walkers. If you, if you um, fix the number of bins in between them, they will be more closely spaced in, along the steeper parts. Um, and less closely spaced along the shallower parts. Is that, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I think, yeah, I think I understood like uh, the way initially you were placing the bins, like the cutoffs, but I was more curious, like, because these cutoffs might be very sensitive from system to system, right? So yeah, is it so, like, uh, so the, it yeah. shouldn't affect the, the probabilities, but um, your bin spacing is tightly coupled to these other weighted ensemble parameters that are, you know, such as the fixed interval for replicating the trajectories um, and, and as well as the number of trajectories that you have per bin. So we usually set that number to be a target number so you get roughly even coverage of configurational space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, any other questions? Audience, anybody? Uh, hi, um, can I? Um, Go ahead. Um, uh, great talk. Um, uh, thank you for the uh, really great talk. I just have a quick question um, on the same line of uh, binning uh, the trajectories, uh -huh. um, the reaction coordinate actually. So I, I, I actually had an opportunity to uh, use weighted on sample. And uh, what I noticed is that uh, maybe you can give me some guidance on this as well. Um, so what in the effort of trying to save computational resource, sometimes I would combine the bins uh, so much to the point that all of the heavy weights trajectory will get trapped in that bin. And do you think in any way that would have an effect on kinetic calculation in the end? 
Well, so uh, in terms of effect, you, you shouldn't get any bias in your dynamics if you're tracking the weights so that they all sum to one. So, so that's one, I'm not sure how you're, wh what do you mean in terms of affecting the rate constant? Um, so like for, um, so for example, um, I use RMSD as the reaction coordinate. And I noticed that um, RM, the bin from zero to four is the, uh, the stable state. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I would divide that up into a finer bin so it can mm -hmm. escape, that, um, escape that state. But then after a while, I combine them, uh, I merge them together again. And then I noticed that all of the heavy weights um, trajectory would get trapped in that bins and, and other uh, trajectories outside of that bin have very low probabilities. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I think now that I, I, uh, I uh, say it out loud, I, I know, uh, yeah, I, it shouldn't affect the kinetic parameters at all. Yeah. Okay, that's, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great, so last chance for other questions. If not, let me thank again, Lillian, for the great and the stimulating talk and for doing a great job convincing us that we should use the method. We will actually, we will get back to you in terms of connection between NAMD and Vespa. And uh, so we would definitely like to try that. Great. Thanks again for being here, uh, Lillian. So that was great. And uh, we're gonna meet in uh, four minutes or three minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Get there Zoom, in the Zoom room. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye -bye. Have a great break. <laughs>